Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Tulsa World Opinion video podcast. I'm Jenny Graham, the editorial's editor, and I am here today with Matt Lay, and he is a member of the Tulsa World Community Advisory Board, and he has written an amazing op-ed for us this week. He is also the, the Tulsa Firefighters Union President, and I'm sorry, I can't remember the number in the name. So what, what, is, the, what is the affiliation? We are with the International Association of Firefighters Local 176. We were the 176th fire department to affiliate with the IFF back in 1919. Wow, okay. So, so thank you for being with us this morning. I wanted to, uh, I want to say, first of all, I've always been a fan of firefighters. Um, always, you know, who isn't? But recently my neighbor had a fire. And I've learned that you don't ever want to meet your neighbors for the first time at midnight when their house is on fire. But it was one of those things where it, it was sad. It was gutted. It was one, you know, midnight. But to see firefighters up close in action is amazing. You know, it was when no one was hurt. All the animals got out. But just to see it, when it, the fire next to your house and the flames are licking up to the trees you really start to appreciate what you do because and how fast a fire can spread. I mean, you hear of stories about a spark taking out a whole block and you see that. And so I've, and so I, I remember I contacted you and said, okay, now I'm a super big fan because <laughs> it's, it's just, but you know, I look back on it. It was almost like maybe a textbook case of a house fire. Like everything went right. It was contained, but your op-ed was interesting. You start talking about all these other things that firefighters do because so many of us like me i think that's what you do you go from house fire to house fire so explain a little bit um you know what are some of these things that people don't know about firefighting you know what you know are, are house fires almost boring compared to what what you guys are doing in addition to 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 that well, the, the one word I would never use to describe a house fire is boring. Um, we, we do train a great deal and, and we're very experienced at it to try and make it look simple or make it look easy. That's that's by design. Uh, but, I, but I will tell you from uh, both inside and outside, it, it is a little bit of controlled chaos. Um, it, it's also the closest thing. Uh, I'll use an analogy. I'll call it game day. I mean, you think about we are the Tulsa Fire Department. For 125 years, we've been putting out fires. And so when we get that call that somebody's house is on fire, somebody's life is in danger, that's that's the Super Bowl. I mean, that is what we are here to do. And frankly, there's no one else that can do it. And, and to put that into context, you know, if you've got the Tulsa Police Department, you got Tulsa County Sheriff's, you got Oklahoma Highway Patrol, you got Muscogee Creek Nation Light Horse, you got a lot of different law enforcement agency layers that can perform the functions of security forces, protective services. There is only one Tulsa Fire Department. And so whenever we are dispatched to something like that, we're literally the only tool in the toolbox that can do the job. So I, I certainly wouldn't uh, describe it as boring, but I will, I will say that we've, uh, we've gotten a lot of opportunities to uh, find excitement in other roles and other uh, areas. The, the way I describe the fire department today is an all hazards response agency. And so what are those hazards? Uh, very easily an emergency medical incident is probably this, you know, the other thing you think of a traditional role for a firefighter. So if you're in a car wreck or someone has a heart attack, you're going to get a fire truck that's going to respond and you're going to have an EMT and a paramedic there to render care immediately. Then followed by what I'll call some specialized rescue functions like swift water, building collapse. We've got technicians and folks that are specifically trained to execute and operate in those environments. Um, and then you've also got uh, a number of other hazardous materials environments, whether they be chemical, biological, radiological, that we have been trained uh, to respond to. And we're kind of the front line whenever uh, an incident like that happens as well. So it's a uh, it is certainly never boring uh, across an array of, uh, of calls. Well, how did that happen? Because most people think you're trained for fires, but in, in your, in your op-ed, you talk about how now you're all trained as EMTs. Now you're getting even more specialized training. And I always sort of, it, part of me is concerned. Like, are we putting too much on our public servants? Are we asking too much of firefighters to be able to, do all of these things or do you find it to be helpful that you can do this i mean it, it's it could be looked at either way 
Is it, is think, it fair to ask those things? Uh, uh, that may be a little bit above my pay grade. Uh, Where's is more to, to, we meet the need. And so uh, many times on a scene, we will find ourselves in a situation, maybe we got called for a fire or an emergency medical, and it turns out, hey, we've got a whole different issue going on here, maybe more of a domestic situation or a mental health crisis. And we're able to sort of take our experiences, take our collective wisdom of, you know, maybe having three or four firefighters with 10, 15, 20 years experience to realize, hey, Maybe it was a situation in our family or uh, maybe even a different job we had sometime or place that we actually know some resources that may be able to help in this situation. So we, we've just kind of gravitated to these other roles uh, as needs come up in the city. We just kind of find ourselves leaning in and there really isn't a, you know, sometimes we probably need to do the cost benefit analysis and realize, do we have the resources and the ability and we will sort of a lot of times take things on and then realize, oh, we probably need to get some additional training or some additional equipment and things like that that get added in later. But many times it is people are so used to call the fire department. Uh, right, got, a, right. got a snake in your bathtub, call the fire department. <laughs> Why? We're not sure, but we're good at that sort of thing. And cats so, and trees. Do you still get cats and trees? We still get cats and trees sometimes. Uh, you, you, it It is never... Uh, it's never really a surprise to hear the kind of calls we go on. Like you'll hear something come out over the radio and, or we're ducks in a storm drain or, or something that's just kind of cute. If we've got a truck available, we're going to go. Uh, we're going <laughs> to, again, we're going to meet that need because that caller thought enough of that to call 911. We don't do that every day. So if it was something that was that concerning that individual or that neighborhood, we're going to do what we can to, to take care of that situation. So, so we, in recent years, all public service areas are having a hard time struggling to find workers. I mean, that's from uh, police to teachers and, and, you know, all sorts of, you know, healthcare workers. So what is it like for the Tulsa Fire Department now? Are you guys, um, is it challenging find, finding new recruits, finding people to, to move into this work? The modern environment has absolutely been a challenge when it comes to workforce recruitment and retention. Um, we're operating with about 10% of the uh, recruiting application pool that we used to have. And I say that so there's some Tulsa World articles from about 10 years ago that talked about 2,000 applicants to the Tulsa Fire Department for 30 positions or 60 positions, whatever we had that year. So 2,000, and now we're down to about 200 in a year that will apply. Wow. And so by the time we get through uh, the various testing states and things that are uh, the different hoops you got to jump through to be a firefighter, there's really not that many left. It may be 80 to 100, and we're picking 25 or 30 of that 80 to 100 instead of maybe 300 before uh, in years past. So it has definitely been a challenge. Add to that, like we said, that the job has changed. It's not just jumping on a fire truck and running to a fire. There is a significant educational component that is now part of our uh, job duties responsibilities. You have to be a licensed EMT in the state of Oklahoma in order to be a Tulsa firefighter. Um, you're going to be asked to jump into a lot of different things. And so there's not just the physical requirements, but there's the academic cognitive uh, requirements. And to do a job like that for a public sector wage scale is not an easy task right now. There's a lot of other jobs you could do as a software developer and uh, or, or in IT or cybersecurity that you can work from home. You can kind of set your own hours and make considerably more than you're going to make in a very dangerous, hot, back-breaking, grueling job like being a firefighter. And then last but not least, I'll say that COVID definitely had an impact uh, on our recruitment as we saw up to almost 200 Tulsa firefighters quarantined at one time. We had firefighters uh, in the hospital. We had high, you know, firefighters uh, in the ICU really struggling. And uh, I think that was a way of call for a lot of folks that, hey, it's not just burning buildings that are dangerous, but mutating viruses that you're on the front lines of. So, um how it, it sort of for people who are interested in this, I mean, we're talking about the challenges, how, how early can a person enter or apply for, I mean, is it, do you have an age requirement on that or 
a couple of years ago, we actually lowered the age to 18. It was always 21 for, I'm going to say, at least the common era, probably the last 50 years. And then here about four or five years ago, we lowered it to 18. And part of that was a discussion of, hey, we need to catch some of these folks before they enter the workforce in another uh, another occupation, and then we lose out on them because they, they've already got a, a career plan established. So we're catching folks, uh, people that have been through Tulsa Tech and maybe have some of those uh, prereqs already knocked out, and we put them right to work at 18. So in, when I was reading about kind of the job, I and mean, it does seem very adventurous. I mean, it seems like there are for a person who likes being, I mean, there are a lot of advantages of it. You talked about being able to work from home, there's another kind of person who doesn't like that. So when, when you think of firefighters, I mean, are there traits or personality, character, things that you think make for a good firefighter? I mean, what do you see as a, a commonality among? I'd say the two traits that I see exhibited most often by firefighters, whether it's their first day of the academy or after 30 years on the job, is courage and compassion. Um, if you've got courage, if you're willing to put yourself in harm's way to help someone else, um, we can teach you the rest. We can teach you the skills. We can teach you the techniques to make you proficient at that and make you good at that and capable, may, able to make a, a house fire in a neighborhood, which is a very chaotic scene, look easy and look like just another day at the office. Um, but the other half of that, that is equally important is compassion, uh, when we went through uh, my academy 18 years ago, we went around the room and each kind of talked about why we became a firefighter. And all 35 of us to a, to a man and woman said uh, to help people. It was just something we all felt. There's a lot of jobs that are even more adventurous or maybe more uh, take you to distant travels or maybe have different advantages, different opportunities. But we wanted to help people and we wanted to help people in Tulsa. And so that ability to be empathetic, that ability to kind of look beyond just the call and realize, hey, there's a there's a need there. There's something going on that we can help with, I think is absolutely a, a commonality amongst Tulsa firefighters. Well, you answered my next question, which was why you became a firefighter, but, but you've now gone into uh, representing you know, the union and as a union president. And I think so many people some people have very strong opinions about unions, but I think there's also a misunderstanding sometimes of what you do. Can you explain a little bit about why you went into this role and how you view your role? I mean, what is your job as the, the union representative and the union president? So on that subject, it, it does kind of go back to why I became a firefighter. 9-11 um, happened my freshman year of college. Uh, I dropped out my sophomore year and joined the Army. Uh, I used uh, my GI Bill to uh, get my EMT and then get on with the Tulsa Fire Department. Uh, there was also another uh, uh, event that played into that. Uh, I had a great uncle that, that was a captain here with the fire department and was involved in a motorcycle wreck. And I got the call from my grandma to go try to help my aunt uh, Linda at the time. So I went to the hospital. And I'm not exaggerating when I would say there were probably close to 100 Tulsa firefighters every room of the OR, in the waiting room, the lobby, um, meeting every need that the family had. And I mean, they were, weren't just taking care of meals. There was already somebody at the house mowing. It was just, you know, it was crazy to see. And it was something that for me, looking for something, okay, transition military service, I uh, realized this was a, a fire family that, that I wanted to be a part of and, and also get to give back and help my community. And so I uh, started my career with the fire department. And then a few years later, we had this thing called the Great Recession. And they started talking about laying off firefighters. And I wanted to understand more about that and what was getting ready to happen to a lot of me and my classmates and the younger firefighters on the job. And so I ran for a vice president position on our executive board. And so you kind of asked what drew me to the union. It was like, okay, it was the same thing. It was, I became a firefighter to help people. I got involved with the union to help firefighters and they can help more people that way. And so uh, that was almost 15 years ago now. And I've served in different capacities from uh, a local district representative, vice president to president of our state firefighters association. And then in 2020, I got elected president of Tulsa firefighters, local 176. 
And so that puts me in a position to, uh, I'm sort of the principal advocate for our firefighters in everything from contract negotiations to discussions about policy, uh, safety protocols, uh, wages, benefits, working conditions. And, and those are the, the kind of highlights of the position, but there's also uh, an incredible amount of community outreach, uh, working with families and things like that that goes into this because uh, the men and women of the Tulsa Fire Department can't do their job unless, hey, they're backed up and supported by the folks at home. And they know that their families are taken care of and uh, whether it's health insurance or, or a pension benefit or something, anything that the local union can do to help its firefighters stay in the game, stay in the fight is going to help our community. Hmm. So you can't, became president right in the middle of COVID. That could yeah. not have been easy. It's a great decision. Uh, hindsight being 2020, uh, <laughs> you know, look back on it. Uh, I, I, like Just like becoming a vice president during the recession in the middle of a layoff, uh, felt like it was for such a time as this. And, and I wanted to lean in and help out in any way I could. And I kind of felt the same way coming out of COVID and feel like we've done a lot of good for a lot of people. Right. Well, you can't control when you get called into to the next next position. But, you know, and looking at, you know, this op-ed really shows how far firefighting has come and what you really do. I mean, I can't imagine adding more to, to your plate, but what do you see as far as evolutions happening right now in firefighting? Do you foresee much change? Do you see, you know, you, technology is always changing, but sure. I mean, what do you see for the future with, with firefighting in general? The, the technology component is always going to make, I'll call them micro adjustments. Everybody's always kind of promising that next big thing that we'll never have house fires if we have this, you know, uh, safe cigarettes that burn out and can't set fires or uh, this sprinkler system or this truck or this foam. But at the end of the day, it's always going to take a firefighter looking at the situation and picking the right tool for the job. Uh, you know, but there are things that are changing our, our tactical operations right now, including uh, unmanned aerial uh, devices, drones, uh, giving us a better vantage point, allowing our command and control units a, a more on-site intel of what's really going on. And so I think those things are changing some on-the-ground operations. Um, but really, the biggest shifts for us probably fall uh, closer to the medical and mental health aspects of, uh, of the community. You, you've got a homeless population that is continuing to grow uh, and, and need additional resources. You have mental health needs that really became apparent during COVID. That was something that we got called to a lot of medical emergencies that after just a couple of minutes of talking to folks, it was like, there's not a heart attack issue, but maybe it's an anxiety or a panic attack. And we're having to just help people go for a walk. I mean, just take some, take a breath. And, and so now we've actually turned that into a formal program to where we have uh, licensed clinicians that, that run with some of our paramedics and take some of these calls. And so they're available, you know, during the day to, Hey, you, that you hear some of those triggers and in, in a 911 call or dispatch that says, man, maybe there's something going on here underneath the surface. And so they'll run with our fire crews and they may step in and offer some additional 988 or COPE's resources uh, to that family or to that individual that, that will help them get the help, the resources they need forward. Um, that is, that's amazing. So I, I, I appreciate you talking with me a little bit, and I hope everyone goes and reads his op-ed this weekend. I really enjoyed it. Um, but I just wanted to let you have the last word. You know, what are some final thoughts or anything that, that you just want people to know about? It really is an honor and a privilege to serve as a Tulsa firefighter. Uh, we believe we work in the greatest city in the whole world, and what makes it great is the people. And so as, as a department, uh, it is our job to fight fires and to, to meet these individual needs, but it's really just about meeting the needs of people. And uh, anytime we get that opportunity, we know we've, we've done our job. Well, thank you so much. And we'll, I'll have you on again sometime because you're still on our community advisory board. So you've got more op-eds coming up. So thank you. And I hope everyone checks out his work this weekend. Thank you.